Previously, we started with a very simple problem. To solve the equation, 3x minus 7 equals 15. And we asked where the symbols and equation ideas came from, maybe also with an interest in what these innovations actually accomplished. I gave sort of a general answer that this change in writing and concepts happened in Europe, starting with Italy in the 1500s. But in this section, we'll look at some of the specific people and their works that contributed directly to what we recognize as school algebra today. What we're doing here should be enough to get the gist, but trust me, there's some fun and important stories I'm skipping over that are worth going back to later after we get this basic gist. Not to mention all the hard problems that were actually trying to be solved or even posed at this time, and how those hard problems led themselves to new questions and new ideas. A good starting point for us is Luca Pacioli. In his 1494 book, Summa de Arithmetica, he claimed there will never be a general solution to the cubic equation, meaning something with x cubed in it. Of course, Pacioli's book isn't remembered for this. It's instead remembered as the birthplace of double entry bookkeeping. Back then, just as now, math matters a lot more when there's money on the line. The birth of symbolic algebra is a part of a larger story that involves the adoption of Hindu Arabic numerals in business, new methods in bookkeeping, the invention of probability and statistics, and so on. So anyway, Luca Pacioli says that this cubic will never be solved, and then someone comes along to take credit for it. Girolamo Cardano is this person. He wrote a book called Ars Magna Sive de Regulus Algebraicus in 1545 that solved this equation. Most of the books that I've read about Cardano's algebraic achievements have a couple short biographical details, but I highly recommend Michael Brooks' much more thorough and interesting biography. Just search for Cardano Algebra on YouTube and ignore all the stuff about the, the new software. A lot of these people are far more interesting once we actually get to know them a little bit and maybe we'll even get a better idea of how math fits into the world by looking at, at their lives and the worlds they lived in a little bit more closely as we continue. Anyway, in Ars Magna, Cardano used algebra to solve this previously impossible problem of cubic and quartic equations. Though something that wasn't written in the book was that he got this idea from Niccolo Fontana, usually referred to as Tartaglia or the Stammerer, Tartaglia showed him this method for how to solve the cubic as one of the secrecy, and Cardano maybe did or didn't break that oath depending on how you look at things. Uh, we'll deal with the, the issues of intrigue later. Right now, I just want to show you an idea of what their work actually looked like. So Tartaglia and Cardano wrote each other letters. Here's how Tartaglia described his solution to the cubic in a letter to Cardano. And roughly, this is what it says since you probably, well, I don't know, I don't read Italian, so this is a translation that I read. One cube plus one thing is equal to 11. It would be necessary to find two numbers or quantities such that one is 11 more than the other, and that the product of the one by the other should be one. That is the cube of the third of things. Once operating above, it will be found that our thing is... And here we do get a little bit of a symbol, this R with a slash in it, kind of like a, a prescription symbol. R U cube R 30 31 plus 5 1 minus R U cube R 30 31 minus 5 1 and not other. So that's pretty weird for us to read now, right? Now this is what that solution would look like today. Pretty different, huh? So it's clear to anyone looking back today that even though we are now crediting these mathematicians with solving these complex algebra problems, problems that are too hard for high school algebra and maybe too easy or too particular for college math majors, and they have some abbreviations for things, you don't really yet see something that actually looks like what we would call algebra. So following after Cardano, we have Raphael Bombelli. He was inspired by Cardano and also wrote a book to teach people algebra, imaginatively titled Algebra. There he used numeral exponents and what people will call a fully symbolic notation though it's still quite different from ours. Also being the first to use complex numbers, which turns out to be an unavoidable route to find otherwise real solutions to cubics. Okay, moving on, uh, Francois Viette is sometimes called the father of algebra. One of the books that we'll read, he, he really pinpoints algebra starting with Viette, which I think is wrong, but he does it anyway. But the reason why he might be pinned as the father of algebra and why we should pay attention to him now is because in his works, which are collectively known as the analytic art, which started to be published in 1591, 
So already pretty far along, we're almost at 1600. He used symbols for known quantities, not just unknown quantities. Instead of seeing like say our equation, three X minus seven equals 15 as a single thing, Viet would see it as one instance of a general linear equation, something like, and the idea there is that instead of X, he's using E, and in general, he used vowels for unknowns and he used consonants for the known quantities. This is a step more general, a step more abstract, and manipulating the symbols themselves instead of there being one unknown symbol that got manipulated in the case of the equation. The more general perspective that he gives us opens the door to a wider consideration of what equations and their solutions can be applied to. Um, we can do things like consider irrational numbers as solutions to equations to really come to pass, something like the 1800s. It should also be noted that Viet enlarged the scope of algebra. He introduced trigonometry to its methods, along with the polynomial equations that we just talked about. Still though, if we look at his work, we don't see the equations that we know and love today. So let's stop for a minute and talk a little bit about numerals themselves. One of the most influential advocates of moving to a system based on Hindu Arabic numerals was a guy named Simon Stephen. He developed decimals farther from their roots Remember, we Europeans brought them from the Arabic world, who had brought this innovation from the Indian subcontinent and possibly earlier from China. But anyway, they, they didn't arrive in full form. Stephen was one of the people that developed them even further and worked really hard to popularize them. His book, La Dime, from 1585, was super influential, particularly to Thomas Jefferson. He was inspired to create a decimal monetary system for the United States. Maybe you've wondered about where the word dime comes from and what it means. Well, it's Stephen's book. That's what it refers to. But still, if we look at Stephen's decimals today, they don't quite look like what we write. Mathematical writing finally starts to look familiar to us with the work of La Geometrie by René Descartes in 1637. In addition to the development of so-called Cartesian coordinates, this is where we get things like X and Y for unknowns and then using early alphabet symbols for constants or for coefficients. There are some differences still if we look though. Descartes, instead of an equal sign, he writes what looks to me like a backwards proportional sign, sort of like a fish. And instead of x squared, he'll write xx. But despite these differences, it's not too hard for a modern reader to follow the equations in his work. Well, at least as far as anyone that follows equations. Descartes was a big deal as you may have heard, but it was his invention of algebraic grounding for geometry that got us all using X. See, prior to this, in this thread of development that goes all the way back to ancient Greece, geometry had the elite standing. It was the real stuff. It was the math that was so thoroughly developed in Greece. And even as Arabic scholars like Al-Khwarizmi developed algebra into its own art, he still proved his results from geometry. Arithmetic, algebra, they always seem to play second fiddle, but when we get to analytic geometry, geometry and arithmetic come to be seen as sort of one and the same. Maybe even that arithmetic and algebra get to be in the driver's seat for once. Using algebra and decimals, anything in Euclid could be fixed to coordinates and measured and calculated directly. This maybe also shed some light on the different styles of math class you might experience coming up in the world. Just as there's dog people and cat people, any person you meet, and maybe yourself, will likely have had a greater affinity for the style of either geometry class or algebra class, and then interpret this preference as a rather deep fact about themselves or the subject. In fact, these subjects come from really different places, and there never was a real like grand unification, a universal math that everything fits into developed. Instead, everything is just sort of grabbed and jammed in there, trying to get a bit of time to everything that people think or once thought was important without a huge consideration for how it all fits together. If you find yourself in Calc 2, for instance, either this semester or at some point in the future, you might wonder why every week is a different topic. Calc 1 makes sense. It's about integrals and derivatives, maybe limits. Calc 3 is about multivariable things and doing those same calculus tricks with things in multiple variables. Anything else that's Calc related, they just put in the junk drawer that's Calc 2. Don't feel bad if you get a little bit of whiplash in that class. All right, all right, back to history. 
Even at this point historically, when we get Descartes and we start using X and Ys and geometry and algebra kind of come together, we still have a ways to go before things really look like what we've got up there. Some of our common symbols like minus and equals and plus, they're not in the picture yet. So how and when do these get adopted? I'm actually gonna leave those details to you. One hint is it's not from any of the people I've mentioned so far, but don't worry, a quick Google will turn them up if you care to look. I know that at some level, we wanna find out who should get credit for this innovation. To be able to attach a single name to this everyday invention, the way that most people will attach like Thomas Edison to the invention of a light bulb or something. But at least here, it's true that which symbols we use is not really as an important of a question as that equations and their parts came to be treated symbolically, like things that could be manipulated mechanically without much consideration of what they actually represented. Most of these authors from the era described their goals in terms of wanting to create an automatic form of calculation, one that required no thought. Gottfried Leibniz, for instance, dreamed of people settling disputes by sitting down and saying, gentlemen, let's calculate. Today, of course, the dream of solving all of life's problems with a little bit of algebra sounds pretty trite, but the impulse lives on. Also, the algebraic notation seems to fall pretty far short of eliminating the need for thought. But we can look ourselves a bit more explicitly at the question of how and whether algebraic concepts and notation make certain things simpler or easier, or how that compares to the common observation that algebra is a tough subject in school. Could both of these things be true at the same time? How? Anyway, getting back to the pioneering voices and the creation of these symbolic methods, I sort of assign some credit by naming a few of the people involved and sharing a little bit about their work, but there are a lot of people involved who I haven't named. And the point is not really about these books and symbols themselves, but that they change the mathematical practices of their readers, the other people doing math. Eventually, this symbolic language would take over nearly all of math. Technologies of thought are a little bit more obscure to follow than something like the adoption of smartphones. But all the same, in the writings that follow from these innovations, we can see the major and subtle ways that people changed their conceptions of what doing algebra was about, how it was done, and what could be done with it. It was at this time that people became aware of the great power of symbolic manipulation, and for the equation concept itself to do a lot of work. This kind of algebra was far more accessible than the esoteric geometry that preceded it. But before we give those folks too much credit for a modern worldview, there's also one subtle thing that still isn't in place. I want to at least mention it now to show you that there's still water in the well that we've dug. The missing piece I'm thinking about is negative numbers. The problem that we started with doesn't require negative numbers for a solution. Properly translated, 3x minus 7 equals 15 would have made some kind of sense to any mathematical scribe throughout much of history and across many cultures. But the similar to our eyes, 3x plus 15 equals 7. In order to solve this, it would require us to subtract 15 from both sides. But that would mean subtracting a bigger number from a smaller number, something that was considered total nonsense and impossible for most of the history of what we call Western mathematics. In the Indian and Chinese traditions, negative numbers weren't so neglected. They were considered along with everything else. But in this Western thread, even at the point where we are with these Italians and the people that followed them, the idea of trying to solve this equation would have been considered nonsense. Even much later, in 1759, Francis Mazer, an English mathematician who didn't like algebra generally, wrote that negative numbers darken the very whole doctrines of the equations and make dark of the things which are in their nature excessively obvious and simple. Alberto Martinez recently wrote Negative Math, How Mathematical Rules Can Be Positively Bent, about both the origin and the philosophical complexities that negative numbers held. There's also a short radio introduction to negative numbers and their history from the BBC program In Our Time. I bring this last one up especially because it's a good example of something you can just go out and listen to briefly and come away with a deeper sense of how negative numbers evolved than almost anyone you'd meet, even mathematicians. Negative numbers took a long time to show up and were controversial for far longer than you'd likely expect. It's a bit tough to pinpoint the moment that math really starts looking like we'd expect in the end, but we could probably do worse than Mark Leonard Euler's Introductio and Analysis Infinitorum in 1748. He was certainly concerned with matters more heady than our simple linear equation, but his writing actually looks modern, save for a few markers of old school typography, like the long S. 
he would have had in mind similar notions when it came to what these signs might represent and the methods of using algebra to solve for unknowns. Of course, by Euler's time, we're not only deep into the algebra of solving equations, analytic geometry, calculus, number theory, plus a whole bunch of mathematical fields that Euler himself invented. In looking for the birthplace of both the ideas of using symbols and equations for algebra and the notation that we find familiar, we bypass centuries of feverish development enabled at least in part by these contrivances. By the time we get to Euler, the mathematical worldview of Enlightenment Europe is still in development and flux, but many of its key pieces and concepts were in place, not just in math itself, but in all the many fields that found themselves transformed by mathematical methods over the centuries, from physics to navigation to commerce. In the next section, we'll deal with some other questions that come about from this point of view. In particular, we'll take a little bit of a wider view and think about why we're even talking about what was going on in Europe during the Renaissance uh, and Enlightenment. So stay tuned for the next section of Anatomy of Algebra.